Esoteric Discussions, a show that gives a voice to the hidden and unspoken aspects of our world, tackling topics in the realms of the metaphysical, the esoteric, the political, and social. So now, join me, your host, Valentine St. Aubin, as I take you on a journey of exploration. Good evening and welcome to Esoteric Discussions with me, your host. I am Valentine St. Aubin. And well, it's uh, it's another Wednesday evening, and I'm here in the studio, but I'm not alone. <laughs> I do have company with me this evening. Martin Axe is back with me here live. Um, he was in the studio with me um, a couple of weeks back, and um, he's back again. And he's uh, brought his co-writer, um, writing partner with him, his good friend Fraser uh, Davies, who's also going to be joining us by Skype and. Uh, in about five minutes or so but before we kick off the show I just wanted to set the mood for this evening so obviously it's the 10th of April 2013 and um, we've got the moon in fiery Aries so uh, I don't know about you but I've been quite energized in the last 24 hours so much so that I haven't been able to uh, sleep (laughs) I've been too busy working and uh, getting things organized Um, but it's been a good day, I think. Uh, the energy seems to be quite flowing freely. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to the show tonight as well, because I think it's going to be a great show. Um, and, um, I mean, just just to quickly wrap up with Aries, because Aries, people who have the sun in Aries or moon in Aries or um, Aries ascendant, they've been kind of having a hard time these last couple of years since 2010. Um some of it's been great. They've had uh, great breakthroughs professionally, like Maria Sharapova. She was uh, world number one again um, last year, and she's getting very close to getting back to number one again as uh, uh, the um, clay court season kicks off, if you like tennis. I'm a big tennis fan. Uh, and she's an Aries, and it really has reinvigorated her career. Um, and that's the good side of it, with Uranus moving through the sign of Aries. But there's also the the other side as well, which has been difficult for some people who have the sun or moon or ascendant in Aries, um, with life um, being a bit difficult and uh, jarring experiences coming out of the blue. That's all very Uranian. That's the type of energy Uranus brings, um, the unexpected, the sudden so um, it's, it's been tough. And, on a, and on, on a global scale, of course, we had Uranus enter into Aries in 2010 and we had the, um, the, um, spring, the Arab Spring uprisings and we also had the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, all very fiery with lots of uh, protesting going on and people trying to demonstrate and, and express their opinion. And, of course, it's all been quietened down and it's, um, it's been... Um, basically stamped out uh, and that is because of Pluto in Capricorn who is doing his best to try to maintain control um, because of course Capricorn rules structures, it rules banking, it rules governments, all those types of things and Pluto loves to be in control. So um, a lot going on and uh, still a lot going that will be going on for the next few years as I've said in past shows We've got Pluto going through Capricorn for the next um, few years. He won't be moving out until 2024. Uh, So in terms of the financial crisis that we have seen across the globe, expect that to carry forward up until 2024. Uh, We will get to the midpoint around 2015, 2016. That's when everything will hit the fan. So... um, as they say, uh, the the world has to keep spinning, so enjoy it. And uh, when the the bad comes through, don't worry about it. Things will have a way of of uh, sorting themselves out. So we're going to take a break, and I'm going to get Fraser Davies on the line. And uh, just so that you know, in case you didn't get to hear the last show. 
uh, we had um, <laughs> we had Martin in the studio um, a couple of weeks ago, and he has written an autobiographical novel with his friend Fraser about life, about love, about. Uh, philosophy about science um so many so many topics that they they covered in this work um it's quite a it's quite a read i mean it's you're look you're reading two men's life journeys and um they it, it's it's done in a certain way where it's expressed through emails through correspondence between two people um thinking and uh, and bouncing ideas back and forth so if you would like to learn a bit more about this novel it's called something spooky at a distance and that um we did explain what that means but we'll recap on that as well again uh and if you would like to learn a little bit more while we take a break you can visit the website at something spooky at a distance dot com um, and that will take you to the website and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. So we're going to take a break and um, when we return, we'll be joined by Fraser Davies. The day I heard his voice, I was dancing in the dark And full of love and lust and hopes and dreams He sang about injustice, so he sang about I told my lover I would be like him His words became a legend In a living of my life They haunted me like perfume in the air Oh, I can't forget that passion As we lay there in the dark An amber necklace tangled in her hair Right, so welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Um, we're just going to test your mic, Fraser, to see if you can hear us and we can hear you. Can you hear us? I can hear you. And we can hear you. We're just going to turn you up slightly. Right, so um, as I introduced the show, um, Martin joined me a couple of weeks ago, as, as you well know, um, and we began talking about your book that the two of you have written together. Um, yep. Which is an autobiographical um, story of an artist and a scientist looking back at their shared history and realizing yep. that um, they have a third person to find who they haven't seen for 40 years. And uh, she, this person, this female, was the, per was the reason why things went wrong. And uh, as it concludes... Um, she might provide the cure to put things right. So, I mean, that's a that's 
paraphrased, <laughs> a, a very paraphrased explanation as to what the story uh -huh. is about. But it's a lot more complicated than that because this is the way that I saw the saw the um, the book when I from the perspective of the reader, how I understood the story, which was there was two men who have lived a certain amount of years and um, found each other again after very strange circumstances and began to become reacqu reacquainted with one another and um, learn about one another once again because it's been so many years lost. And amongst that, all of your ideas about the world, what you believe in, how you feel, are expressed through this storyline. And um, and as we as we have this conversation this evening, we're going to discuss some of these ideas, um, <coughs> some of the scientific ideas that uh, um, bounced around between the two of you, and also that even helped to inspire the the title of of your book. Um, and concepts and, and, and ideas. And I do, before we go into all of that, because we didn't get time, Martin, the last time mm -hmm. we spoke, I definitely want to get your feel and take on um, the the age of disappointment. I think that's kind of <laughs> what you refer to it as, but it's sort of where we are now. In, in, in yeah, we've reached the age. <laughs> yeah, it's a line from a song, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, one of the songs in the project. Uh, you reach the age of disappointment um, when I, I, I guess you feel that some of the things that you wanted to happen aren't going to happen now. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you, you very kindly referred to uh, to us as two men who had um, lived a pause certain length of time. Yes, but we, we are quite old. I mean, look at us. Well, I don't call that old at all. I think it's all relative, you know. I mean, people would say I'm old, but I don't think I'm old. Oh, you're, oh, you're a child. Well, but I'm considered middle-aged. Are you? Oh, yeah. Good grief. I've hit that big mark, you know. Ooh, <laughs> so. Let's move on from this one. I mean, really... <clears throat> I didn't. I, I mean, I, when I, I mean, you're, you're quoting one of my songs. I mean, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't want to appear negative about where I felt I was at the stage of my life. Yeah, okay, I am a certain age. Well, I'm sixty, and uh, uh, my health kind of packed in, uh, which is why I retired a little early. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I honestly do feel that there there's more beyond that. You know, there's different stuff beyond beyond the simple world world of work, but. I still felt it was okay, it was okay to refer to the age of disappointment because you do reach that point where a lot of the goals that you think you've been pursuing, uh, you realise you're you're pursuing things that just ain't going to happen anymore. So you, I think you initially feel disappointed before you stop and think that maybe some of those goals weren't really worth pursuing anyway. I mean, the things I want to achieve now are entirely um, intellectual and artistic goals. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not wanting to climb up the slippery, slippery ladder mm -hmm. of promotion at work, if, if I ever did. You know, but I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. that's a total irrelevance now. So, you know, the age of disappointment, the age at which we naturally will feel disappointment, is certainly not the end. Well, I think what I've done since, you know, I, I retired, yeah. I'm amazed, and and Fraser as well. Mm -hmm. And look at these little chubby chops there. <laughs> We have the benefit of being, of being able to see you. Mm. Um, I think I think, a the scary sight, isn't I think it? the camera is on, but I think you're looking at the back of my head. But um, I'd like for you to to jump in because, of course, um, I've already you've already been speaking, Martin, haven't we? I would love to just hear from you, Fraser. How how was it for you writing this book? And please explain to us how you came to the conclusion that you wanted to um, name the the work with, to give the name. Of, uh, that you gave uh, for this book, uh, something spooky at a distance. Well, what you're actually, uh, what, what's actually happening firsthand is what's um, what's being uh, thrown in our way the entire time we wrote this book. Every time we come to do something serious, there's always something tries to stop us. And we've tried to figure out what's actually going on because the number of times that we've had something serious to discuss and either Skype hasn't worked or the phones haven't worked or the computers haven't worked or emails have gone missing, 
That's my, interesting. Or my email, like, just suddenly, without without warning, while the computer is switched on, all the emails, my like 20 pages of stuff I need to sort out, all gets jumbled chronologically. That's very interesting. Well, mm-hmm. not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, are you, Fred? No, but, it's, but I do find things like that um, of significance, and it's sort of like the universe... Um, you know, sort of getting its ear around, going, "What's going on here?" <laughs> you know, um, what, what's going on here, and just sort of monitoring things um, in a strange way. Because yeah, we we are sort of having kind of communication issues here, trying to get all three of us. This book is going to together. cause increasingly trouble. Uh, quite mm. frankly, we've, we've accepted that. We've, we've certainly let something out of the box. So we're going to take a break, and I'm going to play a song. This is um, a song by Martin Axe, and uh, it's sort of what we're discussing this evening. My father came home safe in the fall of 45. To a future that was his for the taking. He wore a suit and tie, made sure his hands were clean. And he married the girl who'd been waiting. My grandfather still worked the land when he'd done his bit in France. He had a home and a family to build. He still tipped his cap to the passing ruling class. You know the ones who give the orders in the field. But the social order faltered in 1969. My generation thought the world was turning. They promised us a future where we're walking on the moon. But the corpses in my life were still burning My father clenched his fist when I sang in my first song He hated everything I stood for He hated his enemies more than he hated himself He said, how can you call another man your brother? Get yourself a job, old, and work for 40 years. Join the same church as your boss. Then vote for the Tories, cause you're better than you are. Then rise to the top at any cost. I lost my faith in 1979. 27 years old, nothing done. Youth turned to nostalgia, love turned to dust. We were waiting for another war to come. Now history hangs like cancer on the final battlefield. Waiting to undo you in the end. I can see my father, he's hanging on the wire His tattered skin is blowing in the wind So we're going to take another break. So sit back and relax, and we'll be back after this break. Work things out. Times of many things I've just got wrong. Snow falls on you. Snow falls on you. Beauty falls. 
face and snow will fall on the dry sea. Hold on to that memory of everyone that you've loved. I often think of the ones left behind in a field no one will find. And the others who stumbled along the wrong way, crippled and twisted and blind. Okay, so welcome back to the show. You are listening to Esoteric Discussions with me, your host. I am Valentine St. Alban, and we're just going to jump back into this because we now have Fraser on a different line. Can you hear us? I can hear you now. Excellent. And we don't sound like we're in a food processor. No, not anymore. <laughs> That's great. You okay. made the terrible mistake of, uh, of, of trying to interview us. I mean, this... Um, this whole project is a kind of Jonah, really. You know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Well, you know, I have a, a theory with things like this. It means that you're breaking through new ground. That, that when I, because whenever I get, whenever I can feel like I'm being stopped, mm. or when when the when the energy is is a bit chaotic and it's a bit difficult. Well, we're being stopped, all right. I mean, it, yeah. <coughs> well, you're breaking new ground. If you've read you know? the book, if you look at the, the hostile response we got from the uh, the so-called uh, expert in the. Uh, you know, scientific stroke homeopathy field. Yes. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's welcome to something spooky at a distance. Uh, what yeah. we've been in, you know, what's been happening to us for the past year and a half. Well, yeah. and this is a great example of it, isn't it? And uh, so, that what I had asked you, Fraser, was I wanted you to um, to give us a, a very brief rundown because we did speak about this uh, with Martin when he was on. How yeah. you guys came across this title for for your book, Fraser? You have the stage. Well, basically, um, well, you can see the kinds of things which are out of the ordinary that uh, that happen. Um, 
my daughter put a photograph, which is one of my favourites, up uh, on Facebook, and it was of um, Martin and I uh, with our guitar cases. And I was prompted to have a look and see if he was still about, because when we broke up about 39 years ago, I was never very sure what had happened. Um, so that we started the process of, I started the process of looking for him. Um, and it just so happened that at pretty much the same time as I was looking for him, he and I were both seeing uh, somebody from his past on television. Um, and it's, it's something which be, has been included in the book. And it just seemed that um, he was agreeable to to get back in touch. And it just seemed that there were rather a lot of things in our lives where there was touching places and since we hadn't spoken to each other for the better part of 40 years, you know, it was quite remarkable how many things in our lives were running along parallel courses. And um, Einstein had made the comment about something which he hated, uh, which was a quantum effect. And um, he called that something, sp uh, spooky happenings, at, no. Um, spooky action, really, isn't it? Spooky action at a distance, that's what... <laughs> I can't even remember now, and it's one of my favourite quotes. The you, the, you can pronounce it in German, can't you? Uh, Spukhafte Fernwirkung. Very good. Oh, very good. <laughs> um, and it just it, it seemed to be right that we get back in touch just now, and all these strange things <coughs> began to happen. Lots of coincidences, lots of, um, well, what would you call them? Well, I'd like to call them synchronicities. Um, I'm not yes, sure. I think we have mm -hmm. actually referred to them as synchronicities yeah. several times, and you're probably right, that's better than just coincidence. Yeah. Well, because in my world, everything has purpose. I don't, yep. I don't believe in things just happen out of the clear blue sky. The, things happen uh, with a, an effect, and they happen with steps. Sometimes the sequence of steps don't um, make sense because it's not one after the next. But um, when you like you know with the age that you are now especially you can sit back and look at life and kind of connect all the dots so I I see life very much like that um, and that's why I, f I think the story that you two share in this book is quite remarkable because um, what I have to say what struck me first of all is the fact that both of you ended up ill yes um, that's that's one of the first parallels um, so maybe you'd like to explain from your side what happened to you, because it is a very interesting story as well. Well, uh, out of the blue when I was about, uh, I think I was about 39, um, I began to experience uh, swelling of my joints. I began to experience lots of pain, especially first thing in the morning. Um, I had quite a lot of time off work and was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and... Basically, uh, I, and I, I tried to get back on with my life, go back to work, uh, was off for another expend, extended period of time, after which they said, you're trying too hard, you won't work again, you know, we were prepared to retire you a year ago, why have you tried for so long? And I tried for so long because it was a matter of pride, it's sort of a male thing. You know, we just want to get on with it. Yeah, sure. We can still earn money. We can still go out and hunt and yeah. gather. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was a very quick thing uh, and a very straightforward thing, but uh, it's something which has coloured the rest <coughs> of my life. And for Martin as well, now we did explore your story, but you can just briefly tell us what happened to you as well. Well, I, I developed multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. and... Um, I, I carried on working the first time until I was um, until I was 39. Um, I think well, was this like, no, wait, wait, no, I made it 45. I thought I actually made it finally to 45 when I retired the first time and staggered back to well, I had a job as a I was, I was teaching drama eventually, and and, and finally made, sort of staggered on again until I was 55. Mm -hmm. At which point I, I completely gave up. But we discovered, which is why we ended up writing this piece. Um, we discovered that, that, that my illness, at least, had had its uh, nativity in um, something which had happened a long time ago. I mean, it was pretty plain, and this is straight up m medical opinion now, you know, um, that uh, my um, MS was brought on by a, some kind of virus, but 
crucially operating in, in, in the kind of context of um, a profound emotional distress. And it was the breakup of a, a relationship with the um, the woman that we saw on television, mm -hmm. which, which had caused that. So mm -hmm. we, we decided to uh, try and backtrack and find out what happened to me and with a bit of luck find out what happened to him as well. Mm. And so, yeah, I think, I think that connection is, is uh, quite fascinating. And there's, I don't know if, um, if either of you have heard of this person, Dolores Cannon, and she's a well-known hypnotist. Um, she's been around a long time. She's quite old. And um, to make things very short and sweet, she will take her patients very far under. Um, she goes very deep, much deeper than the regular hypnotist will go. And she has discovered over thousands and thousands of case studies that um, she is able to work with patients through their mind to help alleviate a lot of um, the neuroses that they might be suffering from. Because in her world, she what she does, she uses quantum healing. It's a quantum hypnotherapy type healing. Um, and she's able to make contact on many various different levels to get to the to the soul of the person I guess is the best way to explain that um, and she is able to remedy a lot of uh, a lot of the issues but for her she believes that the mind is what actually creates the disturbance in the body so again we have that mind body connection we yeah. worried about that because I mean a lot of um, what you call alternative uh, ideas are, are rubbished mm -hmm. now by, uh, are, yeah. by empiricists who say oh no this is just Voodoo is, is nonsense, yeah. and the the problem is that, that, that for too long we've, we've thought of the mind and the body as being two distinct things. That's a, that's a kind of imposed duality. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, um, I know many doctors who say no, that there is no. That, why is there any separation between mind and body? I don't mean brain and body. I mean mind and body. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I can quote uh, Hippocrates, mm -hmm. the uh, father of medicine, mm -hmm. although I have to say I can only quote him in English in translation, I don't do Greek. Yeah. <laughs> and um, how do you put it now? Uh, don't, um, don't ask why a patient has a particular disease. Ask rather why that disease has chosen that patient. Yeah, that's a very good way to put that. And yeah, that that somehow makes an awful lot of sense now. So the old boy in his toga actually got a few things very right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as things happen, um, it's now believed that rheumatoid arthritis can also be brought on by a time of stress mm -hmm. or indeed a virus. <coughs> you know, it's something which is laying dormant and perhaps would have laying dormant. Uh, unlike Martin, I've not really been able to put my finger on anything that I thought would be the trigger, but mm -hmm. um, it's very possible that the trigger's lying there waiting for me. I mean, when I was reading the book, I was getting a sense with your professional career, um, because you were a medical photographer. That's right. That's correct. But there was maybe a bit of um, unhappiness with what you were doing, in a sense, that you weren't fulfilled fully. Um, no. I mean, while I was a medical photographer, I ended up with a boss who was... Oh, it was the boss, yes. ...totally <laughs> outrageous, but I also mm -hmm. ended up with a, a very um, short marriage after quite a long uh -huh, engagement. Uh-huh, that's right, so OK. This was during my time as a medical photographer, <laughs> so it could hardly be called my happiest time, although at the end of that time was when I met my second wife, who I'm still married to. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't all bad news. Mm -hmm. But again, maybe th there's the disturbance there in a, in a strange kind of Well, there of certainly way. was a lot of disturbance then. I mean, it was, as you can imagine, sort of a, a marriage breaking up and ending up with a, a boss who was unbelievably bad in pretty much everything that he did. Mm -hmm. There was a lot to disturb the... And we have we know those people. <laughs> oh yeah, there, there, there were so many people. of them yeah, right. <laughs> in I the mean, working I think, place. I, mean, our story, I think our story, Fraser, sounds it's it's both very um, very peculiar and unusual and unique, and at the same time, it's very ordinary. Does that make sense? Time is probably universal. That's right. That's an even better word. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so many people have gone through. Uh, you know all the ma the major crisis that we've gone through. So I mean, I think what we've written is is, is got to be you know kind of relevant. You know, uh, I think a lot of people would relate to. I, mean, I think different people relate to different bits, but in in, in total, in a sense, as you're suggesting, Valentin, we've, we've all been there. 
Yeah, well, it seems to be that um, we're all getting there more and more these days as well. The, there is a lot of people getting ill, um, which mm -hmm. we did pick up on in the first interview. And it is symptomatic, I think, of the, the breakdown within the Western society, you know, and um, this push for um, all of these things that we must have. Mm -hmm. And there's no time to digest anything, is there? And that's what was nice about your book, was that um, between the, the dialogue and the communication, you two were able to express opinions and thoughts because, like for you, Fraser, you had time on your hands because you weren't really able to work, so you were starting to read and use that time to read and research, and um, you used that time to, to, to get into scientific concepts and things, didn't you? Well, that's right. I mean, at school, possibly because it was fairly badly taught, I wasn't that... I wasn't that interested in science, but when I found myself be being bedbound for the better part of a year, uh, I was reading lots of stuff, and some of the stuff I was reading were things like New Scientist magazine, which put me onto some books that were popular uh, science, and the more I read, the more interesting it seemed. I couldn't imagine why I had been so disdainful of it at school. Yeah, well, I, mean, I, mean, I didn't like science in school either. <laughs> I mean, being fu fundamentally being ill, being bedbound, being crippled ultimately, um, I'm not being facetious, I mean, it, it, it can turn out to be a, a benefit. You can turn anything to your advantage. If, I mean, if, if you're stuck in bed or stuck in your swing chair in front of your computer, uh, you can't run, you can't skip, but you can think and you can read. Well, I mean, I suppose, look at Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, he fam 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 famous, Professor Hawking famously uh, says, you know, he was a perfectly normal young man, uh, but now he, fi he finds that the only thing he can do is think can't even feed himself, he can only think and mm -hmm. because he can only think mm -hmm. he's got more time than everybody else saw to do and yeah. look where it's got him you know. He has actually said that if it hadn't been for his illness he wouldn't have done nearly as much academically as yeah. he has done yeah. and he's made a huge contribution to science which in his own um, opinion he would not have made at all if he was that fit and healthy young man mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is an upside to most downsides. Yeah, and that's what people have to remember, though. That's, that's, yeah, but it's true. There's always that positive and the reason for the why. Um, and I'm aware of the time, and I, and I really would like to get into some of the topics that you also would like to talk about tonight yeah. as well, Fraser. Uh -huh. well, the political <laughs> stuff, because certainly, um, Fraser, one thing we want to do, actually, maybe in a bit five minutes, is uh, a lot of people who hear that scandalous, scandalous item from Port Stanley. Because I think now is the time they've got to hear this. <laughs> so would you like to do this right up to that? I'll let you explain it. You can explain well, it. Well, yeah, but over to you first, yeah. I'm a bit unsure about what you want me to say about the, the Port Stanley thing. Well, I, I, I suppose, I mean, the... the, the uh, well, you know, we're here on uh, on Valentine's esoteric discussions because our uh, our book is plainly esoteric, but in more senses than three, really. You know, mm. um, I, guess, I guess the book also does delve into the uh, the, the the kind of uh, underbelly of uh, well, geopolitics, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you say the book is a a, arm, a call to arms for baby boomers. That's the one. <laughs> a call to arms. That, it's like a Q in Fraser. It's a call to arms <laughs> to the baby boomers. Oh, so right, it's time right, for right. the baby boomers to wake back up because he used to be awake anyway. You know, definitely. We're the we're the we're the Woodstock you're generation. The, you're the Woodstock generation. It's and time considering to. Considering how many yeah. of us there are, we should really hold the balance of power. And That's it's it. Probably through laziness, apathy, and maybe being ground down. Mm. Not not so many people as should be are actually standing up and being counted. If we, the baby boomers, did stand up mm -hmm. and if we were counted, then, you know, we would hold the balance of power politically, sociologically, economically, and we are the generation. Um, but it's all kind of faded into the distance. We are retired. You know, we, we, we are baby boomers, quite plainly. I mean, I, I was born in 1950. You are 53, weren't you? 54, all oh, right, you child. Yeah. But, <laughs> but we, we are plainly baby boomers, you know, the, the, the population explosion after, after, the, after the Second World War. We were the hippies. We wanted to change the world. And as you say, Fraser, we got sidelined. Yes, we got sidelined by the getting married, getting a mortgage and raising yeah. kids thing. Meanwhile, these ambitious people who uh, neglected their families and their children and everything else and decided the only thing that mattered was power for power's sake, inevitably rose to positions of power and look at the mess we're in now um, 
Actually, some of these some of these um, <clears throat> banking chappies are baby boomers as well. They're they're yeah, they're the psychopathic problem, aren't they? Mm-hmm. As, as somebody else once said. Yeah, Fraser's right. We we, we could change the uh, we could change the world almost overnight, and in this country certainly, uh, if the baby boomers just got their act together and realised if the baby boomers could be militated and motivated, uh, we would quite simply decide which party got into power here in two years' time. Mm-hmm. End of. Well, this is it. There's, there's, these things are simple in the con- you know in the wider context. It's just trying to get everybody on the same page is the problem. You know, it's the doing. Um, I mean, how do you feel about Margaret Thatcher? I mean, <laughs> there's been so much stuff going on in the last couple of days um, on the television, remembering her um, legacy. I mean, oh I was out of the country. I was in America. I grew up in America, but I had Reagan and Bush instead. But, um, you know, I, I, I just can't see how she's this wonderful person. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I'm Scottish, living in Scotland. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Scotland to Margaret Thatcher was just somewhere she tried out unpopular policies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She had very little by way of votes to lose, therefore uh, she experimented on us far more than any other part of the country. So she doesn't have any very many friends in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I think there's only one Conservative MP in Scotland now. Um, yes, is there still even one? I know there was one a year ago. I'm, I, I, I'm not it's, sure. one, it's one maximum. I thought there was one hanging on, barely, but, uh, you know, Thatcherism and uh, Conservatism in general uh, are no friends to Scotland. If you ask somebody in the street up your way, um, you know, if, if they're considered voting really Conservative, I mean, the nicest response would be that they'd laugh at you. Mm. An I uglier mean, response would be more painful. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, <laughs> celebrate her death, but neither would I particularly mourn it. I'm just kind of uh, apathetic about it, really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, in fact, there's a queue in. I mean, if Valentin queues up um, Port Stanley Sunday. Well, we're really tight on time. I mean, we, we can definitely put that towards the end. Well, we do it that way. Um, we can do that towards the end. All right. Uh, so that you have more, a bit more time. Well, fine, we'll do that at five. five yeah, because because I think I think, I think this, this week, because it's so... No, well, we'll, we'll right. keep that... We'll, 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 we'll revisit that before we put the track on. OK, yeah. fair enough, yeah. Um, and then we can we're, str- pl- we're struggling with timing oh, and technology and, can, and everything. And we can, yeah. we can play that as we, sure. as we end the show. Yeah, we'll keep, OK. Um, but I, I, mm. I wanted... I just really want to just get to this question. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> to ask Go Fraser. for it. That's fine. Yeah, you're I, right. was, um, I was intrigued to learn about your science fiction novel that you wrote, uh-huh. um, which got published many years ago. Well done for that, because that's not easy. That's not easy getting a publishing contract and seeing that yes letter (laughs) come through the post. And I just wanted to ask you because I know that um, this is a topic that I think you enjoy as well, like ufology. Um, Where do you stand with with all of that? I mean, um, you know, I am actually fairly representative of a lot of scientists, and it will come as a surprise to you probably that there are so many stars and so many galaxies out there, it's almost inconceivable that there aren't, I would say, numerous other uh, civilizations out there. I mean, there's more than, there's something like 200 billion stars in our galaxy and in excess of 100 billion galaxies. It's just outrageous to think that we are the only life in the entire universe. Yeah. That being so, we are only a very... Our solar system formed in the last third of the time since the Big Bang. So there are galaxies out there which are two and almost three times older than we are. And if civilizations have grown up in those galaxies, and if any of them were still about, they would be thousands, millions, perhaps even billions of years ahead of us. We're sending probes out. There's two probes uh, just about to leave our um, solar system. It's inconceivable that other civilizations aren't sending probes out. Um, I firmly believe that I would be very surprised if we hadn't been visited at least by some probes. Whether or not they were manned or whether or not they were alien beings on there, I think alien beings certainly exist out there. Uh, and I think we have certainly seen some uh, efforts at either research and as a contact us. 
Yeah, well, well said. And, um, you know, and I did say to, to, um, <laughs> to, to Martin, you know, well, if uh, Fraser comes on the show, because I know he likes his science, I just wanted yeah. to make sure that this, <laughs> that he knows that this is an, you know, an esoteric, an esoteric type show. Um, and I say, I, I didn't mean anything, I didn't mean any harm in that, just in the, in the pure context that a lot of scientists, you know, th- there's this move going on in Western society at the moment where a lot of scientists are becoming devoid of understanding um something bigger than themselves that you need to be atheist to 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 be a scientist and all of that's nonsense because you know scientists have always been very creative and outside of the box thinking individuals i have an uncle who's a scientist he was part of the stem cell research group yeah. you know uh, on the the engineering side and he's a fan, he's a fantastic man to sit and talk to you know the people and, that um, you're talking about i would refer to as bad scientists yeah. because in science you cannot rule anything out unless you have proof positive that that particular thing can happen or that particular entity can exist. Mm -hmm. And since nobody can prove definitively that there is no such thing as alien visitation, UFOs, then a good scientist may think there's a vanishingly small chance of it, but they must accept the fact that there is a chance. And the scientists that dismiss that out of hand I would say, are not being true to their science. Mm -hmm. Only dismiss what you can prove categorically. Don't dismiss what you can only speculate about. And I want to just say one point to that. I had a guest on my show um, back in, it must have been 2011 now, uh, Anne Eller, who was one of the last secretaries for Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was one of the um, astronomers... um, uh, in, in for America at the time and it was his responsibility to basically debunk any UFOs mm-hmm. so he was there at Roswell and he's the one that came up with the um, the, the gas thing and the, the balloon or what, what, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. the weather balloon, the weather yeah. balloon. Um, he also briefed Spielberg with Close Encounters of the Third Kind He's the, he is the person that was responsible for classifying UFOs he came up with all of that and he knew definitely that these things were real, but he had to, in the mainstream, mm-hmm. debunk them. He was also a high-level mason, and that's, yeah. Something, yeah, and that's something to be Stay said. No yes, You know, and so it's, it, it is very refreshing to hear you say and call it bad science because, you know, I, I love all of those things, but I, I also have to say we don't know it all, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I think it's okay to say, you know what, this is a theory, this is an idea, let's observe it, let's mm-hmm. let's um, test it um, and see how far it can go and then yep. it allows other people to come in and do the same thing and then we start to try to answer the questions. I know you were hesitant about, you know, about Fraser, I think, oh God, a scientist, he's going to debunk everything but, you know, plainly I'm an artist yes, and, he's yes, a, well. and he's a scientist. And he's an artist too, I mean, well, that, that's right. musical together. Well, well that's right, but, I mean, but, uh, you know, but we, we, we looked at everything in this project, in this book, mm-hmm. scientifically, and suddenly Fraser had to put the brakes on any anything that might have gone off that course, mm-hmm. and despite that, or because of that, look where we look what we arrived at. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty powerful stuff. I'm going to do the quick plug and say, mm-hmm. goodness sake, to find out how to get hold of this thing, just go to the website. Are you ready? www.somethingspookyatadistance.com got to say that. That's great. And you did it so well. Dot com. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Do not be surprised if your computer explodes whilst trying to download <laughs> Well, that's right. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. Well, it has, I mean, it's, it's been a really fascinating discussion this evening and um, yeah, the, the, te- so short. <laughs> the, te- the technology, the technology, the technology beat us. Short, yeah, yeah. The, to- the technology beat us. But it was, again, it was just strange things. I mean, it, it has no real rhyme or reason to it. <laughs> and this is what has been happening to us literally mm-hmm. for the last year and a half. Mm-hmm. You'll just have to have back some time to sort of pick it up yet again. Mm-hmm. Have I, I have had this on my show. I, I have had this with a couple of guests who, um, who are trying to push through certain boundaries, and I have had these kinds of strange things with the technology sort of go, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting used to it on the show. But I have to say, it's been a great pleasure 
um, speaking to you tonight, Fraser. Well, thank you. And it's been um, lovely uh, for me as well. Yeah, and um, please tell the audience or the audience the book that you wrote, the name of it, and if we can get a copy, because I'd like to read it myself. It's called The Watchers by... Uh, now, here's another one of my pen names. Uh-huh. Uh, I've got pen names for every different thing that I write. Uh, it was uh, The Watchers by G. K. McLaren. Okay. Now, it's out of print, but I believe the last time I was on Amazon, some people were selling it secondhand. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to look for that. Um, I would very much like to get a copy. Is there any way that you could maybe reprint well, I think that I on might Amazon? Have, um, uh, Through Kindle? I certainly had some copies uh, for the family and whatnot. I think I might have one rattling around upstairs. So Let us know. If you, if, if you can't yep. find one, I can lend her mine because I've got yeah. one. Yeah, I, I, I can probably like find one. I'll be able to send one down. Well, I will send it back to you. Oh, you wouldn't need to do that. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, and because I just want to make sure we have enough time for this last song that you wanted to play as well, Martin. So well, I think we're all talking about a sequence thanks to our technological adventures, but both Fraser and I felt. I think I can speak for both of us, that we really wanted to play this. It's a five-minute track, but it's kind of important. Uh, it comes out of the kind of political diven- dimension of the book. Um, you'll find the late Margaret Thatcher's voice at the beginning of the track. This is a live recording. So that's it, guys, another edition of uh, Esoteric Discussions. To close out the show tonight, here is Martin Axe. Mr. Speaker, sir, the House meets this Saturday to respond to a situation of great gravity. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. After several days of rising tension in our relations with Argentina, that country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control of the islands. I used to have friends who died by bullets or fell screaming in flames in their ships and their planes. Now voices behind me say, now I'm not wanted. It's a poor Stanley Sunday and it's pouring with rain People back home read their Sunday papers Read the conflict, they sugar their tea Economic recession and public depression Are diverted by thoughts of our boys overseas For we're flying the flag and we're showing what we're made of The great British spirit that put Hitler to flight Feeling a bit homesick is character building Dying is glorious when you're in the right When we come home, it's all the flag waving the tearful reunions with wives on TV The curious thrills for out-of-work miners Frustrated housewives, but you're not fooling me For the truth is six months when you've not seen your woman You sleep six to a room, but you still feel alone And you're sick of the jokes about pinups and toilets And you don't want a whore, you just want to go home Government leaders sit in fat pinstriped arses They ponder the moves of expendable pawns Political gambits are other men's losses And another piece soon fills your place when you've gone Half dark of a late night party where bored expatriates circle like flies. They burn with ambition through masks, always smiling. For friends get you things that money can't buy. And a 
side-eyed girl sits alone in a corner. God knows we both had our sorrows to share. I wanted to hold her if the morning came slowly. And just to hear her say she believed I cared. And it's six o'clock on a Sunday morning. When curtains are drawn and the city is dead I left very quietly, I'd never be back there I'd left the girl sleeping alone in her bed I kept on walking without looking backwards I thought of the thought that she didn't care And I thought of a moment that couldn't be longer but the smell of her perfume was still in my hair. I lay in my bed on a Sunday morning. I fell asleep with the radio on. Love songs are whores from the sun to make money. Now the cost of my song is the pain, now she's gone. Oh. Thank you.